gone but not forgotten. How can we forget the Maruti 800? This is the car that put India on wheels. This is the Indian version of the Volkswagen Beetle, the Mini, the car that changed everything when it came to Indian motoring. And it is a car that everybody has a personal connection with. I'm sure you guys do have it. For me, that picture, that's me as an eight-year-old in this very same garage. Of course, this is not that same car, but this is a red 800 from that very same generation. 35 years ago, I sat behind this wheel and marveled at the technology, at the futurism that the 800 was when you compare it with the Ambassador and the Padmini that we drove in those days. This car changed everything for the Indian motorist. What are your memories of the Maruti 800? We'd love to hear about it. Drop it in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to like this video if you enjoy it and also share this video and subscribe to the Evo India channel because we have plenty of gone but not forgotten videos coming up to coincide with Throwback Thursday. This one is on the Maruti 800 and all three generations of the 800. We have plenty of stories, long stories. So check out the chapters below if you want to skip ahead. But trust me, this is half an hour that's going to be well spent. The 800 story began with the SS80 that was launched in 1983. In 1986 came the first facelift, the SB308 or MB308 as it was designated in India. We will be driving a 1995 model that after nearly a decade got one update. A new grill, that was it. And we wrap up this video with a short-lived but mighty quick 5-speed 12-valve MPFI 800. But first, grab a hot or cold beverage and brace yourself for a very, very long history lesson on how Maruti Suzuki and the 800 came to be. The Indian people's car, that was Sanjay Gandhi's pet project and he started off Maruti Motors Limited. In 1972, he also showcased a prototype of the car, but then we're not going to get into the politics of it and the emergency. For the purposes of the story, Sanjay Gandhi, he died in a plane accident. He used to fly stunt planes and then his mother, Indira Gandhi, she privatized Maruti Motors into Maruti Udyog Limited. She found some of the best bureaucratic brains in the country back then, put them in charge of the project and then she gave them a mandate. December 1983, that's when she wanted to see the Indian people's car on the roads of India. So, research. Now, how do you do research back in the day before the internet and all of that? You use books and these bureaucrats, they use the World Car Guide. Now, people who've got white hair, they'll remember this book. It used to come out at the end of every year. It was a thick book and it listed down every single car made everywhere in the world. Armed with that knowledge, they went to Europe to the 1981 Frankfurt Motor Show. They met some of the big European manufacturers. Fiat, they weren't that interested because they already had an existing partnership with Premier Automobiles. Volkswagen, they offered the Gol, which was the hatchback they were making in Brazil, and the Jetta sedan. Peugeot, they were interested. Renault, they were really interested. In fact, they offered a car which was slightly bigger than the Ambassador, but the whole cost economics of that project, that did not work out. So these guys, they came back to India and back to the drawing board. More research was needed, so then these bureaucrats went to Japan, to the Tokyo Motor Show at the end of 1981. There they saw these small, dinky Japanese cars, which perfectly fitted with their ideal of an Indian people's car. It would have been cheap because their target price was 40,000 rupees and they wanted it to be fuel efficient, which these cars were. So they met with the Japanese majors. Toyota, they weren't that interested. Mitsubishi, these guys got overawed because Mitsubishi's budget was more than the GDP of our country. Daihatsu, they strung along our officials. But eventually, Suzuki came good. There was a director of Suzuki Motor Corporation who was in Chennai to meet with the TVS Motor Company guys for their motorcycle project. And on the flight to Delhi, he read a copy of India Today where the whole saga of India's people's car was there. He went to Japan, he told his bosses. Japan sent a telefax to India saying that they were interested. Emule officials went to Japan, met with Osamu Suzuki. In April of 1982, the first MOU was signed. In October, the complete arrangement was done. All the license agreement was done. And 14 months later, in December 1983, on Sanjay Gandhi's birthday, the SS80 was launched in India at the target price. X-Factory, 45,000. And this is that car, the SS80. It was based on the Suzuki Fronte, which was launched in 1979. It was badged the Maruti 800 in India, and it introduced India to front-wheel drive. 
Now, a lot of you all have pointed out in our comments on the past Gone But Not Forgotten videos that both for the Ambassador and the Padmini, we don't really mention that it was rear wheel drive. Well, we didn't mention that because why do we love rear wheel drive? Because you can slide a rear wheel drive car on. But those cars, they did not really have the power to do all of that. But I have to point out, the Maruti 800 was front wheel drive. It was radically new in India in the 1980s. And this introduced so many new features to Indian motorists. Front disc brakes, bucket seats, a floor shifter, a car that did not break down. It did not break down. You cannot underestimate the importance of that. This changed everything. The quality angle, it cannot be understated. All my memories of the Ambassador, of the Padmini, all involved cars breaking down and you having to work on those cars yourself. All our expectations of reliability, of quality, of cars to never, ever, ever break down. All of that, the foundation is this car, the Maruti 800. It changed everything. It changed the whole country's perception of quality. The 800, it was quiet, it was smooth. Okay, it is making a little bit more noise right now because the exhaust is leaking, but it actually sounds good with it. Leaky exhaust sound good on some cars, but it was smooth, it was easy to drive. It stopped, it had disc brakes. Now these early cars, they did not have boosted brakes, but even then, the braking potential and the power was far more than we had experienced. In terms of the handling, this handled really well. Front wheel drive, light, compact, even though it had narrow 12-inch cross-ply tires, it still handled much better than anything, anything that we drove in those days. And it's just so easy to drive. You don't even think about power steering because in a car that weighs 620 kilos, makes 37 bhp, you do not need power steering. This is all enough. It's just simple, easy driving and just genuinely good engineering. Oh, but the ride quality is not so great. <laughs> Leaf springs at the back. Again, when you compare it with the Ambassador and the Padmini, it's on par. But it's just so much tinier. The footprint is nothing. And it's so light. Two people sit here and the car is full. That's it. It's like the back two doors are an afterthought. It doesn't need those back two doors because who's going to fit it at the back? Why do you want to use it? This is simple, easy motoring. It takes you back to the days when I grew up in Pune. It had narrow streets that were all leafy. Just easy driving, no stress in life, no hurry, no rush to get anywhere. Stick one hand out of the window, lovely weather, Pune rains, it is the best. Memories, that's what old cars bring back. And with this leaky exhaust farting away in the background. <laughs> you cannot even imagine the kind of hype that the 800 created. Within the first two months of bookings being opened, the entire production for three years was sold out. This car, it was priced at 47,500 X factory, which translated into 52,500 on the road. The first customer, he got his car 14 December 1983. Harpal Singh, he was an Indian Airlines employee, became world famous. That white 800 that he received the keys to from Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister, who finally realized the ambition of her son, Sanjay Gandhi, to make India's people's car. And that price, 52,500, was maintained for the next three years. How Maruti Udyog got to that pricing is also another story in itself. So the government, to aid Maruti Udyog, they dropped the customs duties and import duties from 120% to 25%. And that's how Maruti Udyog actually hit their pricing. And it was just the start of government policies enabling and helping Maruti Udyog to become the behemoth that it is now today.
by the time my grandfather's booking for the 800 matured in 1986 there was a brand new car but then the transition from SS80 to SB308 wasn't as seamless as you would imagine now when the SS80 came to India it was already four years old and there was a new car coming out a year later but Suzuki they hadn't told the Maruti Udyog officials and how would those guys know we Indians we were used to premier Padminis the ambassadors that carried on for decades unchanged we had no clue about modern life cycle changes so we did not know there was a new car coming out and Suzuki they had no intention of upgrading the SS80 they wanted to foist the same old car onto India so legend has it that we Krishnamurti that then MD and vice chairman at Maruti Udyog he went down to Japan and he went and banged on Suzuki's table and he said that Maruti we did not get into a collaboration to make old cars Suzuki they were convinced and in the June of 1986 the SB308 came to India priced at 63,900 the styling changed quite dramatically the straight lines smoothened out and were made more curvy there was more practicality the glass hatch making way for a proper tailgate it had almost the same footprint but it looked bigger more substantial and more aspirational what didn't change was the f8b motor same 796 cc 37 bhp four speed gearbox and when you consider that the 800 weighed only 620 kilos it wasn't that slow it was actually quite all right it was a difference between two extra slices of butter toast for breakfast that was the difference and impact on power to weight i still remember the day that my dad he drove up to pick me up from school in our red 800 he had just got delivery and he came and surprised me at school and what an impact that red 800 had on me on all my friends in school it was a seminal car so we had the ambassador we had the padmini but here this cute little red car it was immense it was probably the impact that you would get today when you finally see a tesla on the road when it is finally launched in india that was the kind of impact maybe even more you hadn't seen a modern car you hadn't driven a modern car you hadn't sat in one of these and it drove so differently from ambassadors and padminis now first obviously was the front wheel drive platform then the engine no noise you could have a conversation with your passengers even at top speed which was around 120 kilometers per hour you could go around corners you could actually go around corners without a problem without thinking twice this car the 800 when we finally got ours in 1986 we drove it all over the place so we used to go for holidays drive it down to kerala back to pune long distances and those days roads were hardly in the shape that you see today even today we complain about the roads those days it was even much worse but this little dinky car it handled everything it handled overloading it handled bad roads everything it took it in its stride and it never broke down now we have a bit of perspective two months ago we drove the ambassador on the gone but not forgotten series then we drove the padmini last month now we are driving the maruti 800 and this feels like a modern car those other cars they felt archaic they felt like a generation before before the modern car the car that we know it came into being but this it feels like a modern car okay much slower than our regular cars but this is what a car feels like compared to the ss80 this sb308 it had 25 mm more in the wheelbase so it became a little longer a little wider a little taller and a little bit more spacious inside the cabin this was actually a five seater though how five people fit inside this god alone knows to go with the roomier cabin it got a different dashboard which looks a little more substantial than the one on the ss80 a new steering wheel the locks it moved to the doors moved away from the handles out here so anybody with a little wire could unlock your maruti 800 the tailgate it became a proper opening tailgate unlike the ss80 where only the glass actually opened like i said a little more space inside and this unit you're actually fascinated by it you have to take yourself back to those days when cars did not even have air conditioning our 800 it did not have air conditioning but just looking at this whole blower unit where you had cool and hot written you turn this knob and that display changes to red from blue it's not a 
illuminated display is just like a sort of sticker out there you had these four speeds for the blower you could change the direction of the blower so either at your face or at your feet you could change to recirculation these things okay they sound silly talking about them right now but then we didn't even have blowers forget air conditioning it was just so modern so futuristic so high tech it felt like you had arrived in life and the thing that this wasn't really the purpose of the 800 the purpose of the 800 was just to put more and more people on the road but it took us into the modern world of car owning steering that you did not have to fight you didn't have to really use your muscle to turn it brakes you didn't have to stand on it with all your might and even though these weren't power assisted but these brakes worked very well you could go around corners you could just do 10 times the distance of an ambassador in 10 times the comfort this car it has factory fitted seat belts but earlier the 800 did not get factory seat belts how it came to be is actually an interesting story so in 87 maruti they backed an order to export the 800 to hungary and for that they had to import some kits to convert it into left hand drive and also they had to import seat belts from japan because those were compulsory in europe and that's how seat belts came to be in the 800 uh, there's my car actually did not have seat belts our car was an 86 car no seat belts on that but then those times who cared who worried about crash safety and all of that these little a pillars we loved them because it gave you great visibility there's another story of how the zen came to be so the zen was designed to meet the newer legislation that was being enforced in europe which this 800 which was being exported to europe as the alto would not have met and india was the manufacturing hub for the Zen. Now, Suzuki in Japan, they wanted to discontinue the 800 and replace it with the Zen. Also, they had another motive because the 10 year license agreement was going to lapse and they would not have got any royalties from the 800. So, they did not want to make the 800 in India anymore. But the MUL management, they prevailed upon Suzuki and they insisted that both the Zen and the 800 continue side by side and they also worked out a new royalty agreement where Suzuki would get paid 1000 rupees of royalty per 800 sold and that would ensure that Suzuki would take care of upgrading the car as and when legislation or emissions demanded it and that's how the 800 continued for two more decades and this is the update that we got. This marked the biggest change to the 800 in over a decade. It got new headlamps, it got these wraparound bumpers, it got that bulky rear bumper, the interior was upgraded, it got the Zen steering wheel, and then three years later, the really juicy bit came along. Under the bonnet, the engine, it was upgraded to fuel injection, it had a three-valve head, and it had the five-speed gearbox. This was a pocket rocket. <laughs> facelift 800 it came with the same three cylinder carbureted 37 bhp engine but then at the start of the 2000s it got fuel injection it got a four valve head and it got a five speed gearbox power it went up to 45 bhp and that really really made a difference to the performance of the maruti 800 this fuel injected engine it made the 800 a pocket rocket It really does move. It's such a light car. 640, 650 odd kilos, 45 bhp. It makes it fast. Surprisingly fast. In the road test that Autocar had done on this fuel injected 800, they had a picture of the Speedo being tested at the VRD and the needle had gone past 140. 140 is the last digit out there and it had gone past 140. So it had clocked the full Speedo. And that was such a cool picture and that really imprinted the performance of the 800 on our minds. But of course, the 800, when it got this fuel injection, it had also got new rivals, rivals like the Matiz, the Santro. And even though this was quicker, this was also the oldest car in the lot. By then, this dash, the space inside, everything was just very, very dated. The steering wheel, 
it was from the zen but without the leather covering that the zen got so extremely basic of course it was always a basic car but this felt really old and the 800 it never got power steering not that it needs it but when you're taking three pointed turns that's when you realize that oh no power steering eh now in terms of the suspension if you remember some of the maruti 800s had dx at the back dx was for coil springs so these cars they got coil springs instead of the leaf springs and of course it made a difference to the ride quality as well as to the handling in fact you could get cornering shots of this 800 with the inside rear wheel up in there like what we get right now with the polo so this was a hot hatch before the term hot hatch was even coined so 0 to 100 as per autocar's road test then it took 18.5 seconds without the air conditioning and it got standard air conditioning with the air conditioning it took 20 point something seconds and this was a big improvement over the carbureted in fact it was 9 and a half seconds quicker to 100 km per hour than the carbureted 800 so that was the step up in performance that fuel injection delivered to the maruti 800 fuel injection and the fall valve head but then maruti also realized that this car was eating into sales of the alto 800 that it was too fast for its own good so in just 3 years just 3 years they discontinued this engine so they moved back to the old two valve per cylinder head they kept fuel injection because they had to keep it for emissions but they moved it back to the four speed gearbox and they brought it back to 37 bhp can you believe it they went back a step instead of going forward they moved back they regressed and that's why these five speed 12 valve mpfi maruti 800s are actually pretty rare after the ss80 this is probably the rarest of the maruti 800 generations it was too fast for its own good can you imagine in america they probably use this phrase for a corvette but here the 800 is too fast 0 to 100 in 18 seconds was too fast bring it down detunate back to 37 bhp back to 0 to 100 in 25 26 27 seconds <laughs> then five speed gears five speed gearbox one of the things that this facelift also got were intermittent wipers Yeah, it was a novelty with the 800. It did not have intermittent wipers until then. You know the Tata Nano that was supposed to be India's people's car. Except when the Nano was launched, the Maruti 800 was still in production. Of course, the Nano it was more contemporary. It had more space. But the 800, it wasn't that much more expensive than the Nano. 25, 30 000 rupees more, and it had the engine in the proper place in the front. You did not have to open the bonnet to fill it up with fuel. The tailgate it opened up. The engine was infinitely smoother and also more reliable. This was better engineered. Period. And that is why. Over 2.8 million of these Maruti 800s were manufactured. Over 2.6 million were sold in India. Everybody, and I mean everybody, has had an 800 in their house. What are your Maruti 800 memories? Drop it in the comments below. We'd love to hear about it. And if you've enjoyed this episode of Gone But Not Forgotten, give us a thumbs up and share this video with like-minded enthusiasts. We'll be back next month on the second Thursday of the month with another episode of Gone But Not Forgotten. What should we be featuring? Let us know in the comments. 